Hello there. Allow me to take you back and tell you the story about a little game known as Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. It's a game released in 1999 for the original PlayStation, and for the past decade or so, this game has taken the world of speedrunning by storm. Forbidden Memories was everywhere. It was practically impossible to avoid, even if you tried. It seemed like everyone had a friend who had tried running the game, and if not, you probably stumbled upon the game in a stream somewhere. It was like a plague that spread to all corners of the speedrunning community. It didn't matter if you were a PlayStation, Nintendo, or PC guy, Forbidden Memories had an allure to it. But what was it that drew people to the game and gave it such an infamous reputation? Today, I hope to answer this question as we dive into the story of Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories, the ultimate roulette of speedrunning. Speedruns Live, a place where many of my videos seem to start. A classic website used for finding streams related to speedrunning and racing your friends in your favorite games. As the legend goes, a speedrunner by the name of BJ was streaming Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories casually on their Twitch page. BJ was most commonly associated with speedrunning the Spyro games, and that's mainly what the runner SSBM Stuff, aka Saboom, followed him for. Saboom had played Forbidden Memories when he was a kid and was pleasantly surprised to see BJ streaming the game, as memories from his youth came rushing back, reminding him of how much he loved the game. The following day, BJ and Saboom, along with runner DSmon, would see who could beat the game's world tournament the fastest. This race took place all the way back in January of 2013, and is the first recorded race of the game on Speedruns Live. Looking at the player comments, it seemed like the guys had fun, and we can presume they were all together in a voice call on Skype, chatting it up. This was effectively the birth of the game, but eventually, someone was going to be brave enough to race the full game. To take it just that one step further. And we only have to look two races above, where five players would attempt just that. And this paints an entirely different picture. A 12-hour completion, a 21-hour completion, and three forfeits. This was the first proper attempt at beating Forbidden Memories in a speedy setting. And out of the five, Saboom's attempt would go on to be somewhat of an urban tale. As the story goes, Saboom's attempt was an absolute endurance test, spanning over 30 hours of continuous play before finally throwing in the towel from exhaustion. During this stream, 1,000 viewers witnessed the madness that was Forbidden Memories, and Saboom would also go on to get partnered due to the viewers he pulled. The 30-hour marathon of a stream is unfortunately lost to time, but many were inspired to give the game a whirl after watching him play it. And so, the seeds were planted, and the rest is history. But what happened during this race to cause such wildly different completion times between first and second? And why did three people forfeit? The answer is that this game is an absolute RNG nightmare. So let's talk about how to play it. Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories does not play like your typical Yu-Gi-Oh! game, but some core concepts still apply. If you're not familiar with any Yu-Gi-Oh! whatsoever, don't worry, I'll explain the basics of dueling in this game. Let's take a look at a random duel played by the runner Matt13 against Rex Raptor, one of the first opponents in the game. Every player begins by drawing five cards, where you can then begin to summon monsters onto the field. In Forbidden Memories, you can fuse together cards to make stronger monsters by selecting multiple from your hand, done by pressing up on the D-pad. On Matt's first turn, he sees that he has a plant and a female card, which makes Queen of Autumn Leaves with 1800 attack. Pretty decent stats for the early game. Rex then plays a card in defense position, as he has nothing strong enough to take down Matt's card. On Matt's second turn, he plays Armored Zombie at 1500 attack, his best option since there aren't any better fusions in his hand. On turn 3, Matt performs a common strategy known as tossing, also known as cycling to some. Matt selects Karibo and beats Snake, but the two cards aren't fusible, so the game tosses Karibo out of the game. The sole purpose of this move is to dig for more useful stuff in the deck. Since you always draw until you have 5 cards in your hand, it can be beneficial to get rid of some trash cards that won't be of any use. In the following turns, Matt whittles away at Rex, until his health points reach zero, winning him the duel. As Matt wins the duel, a couple of stats show at the end. The amount of star chips gained, a form of currency we'll get into later, the card you obtained from winning the duel, and your overall rank for how well you did. Your rank is determined by a plethora of factors, such as speed, amount of fusions, and a lot more. This plays into what card drops from the duelist you fight. There are three separate so-called drop pools for each duelist in the game, S and A-POW, 
SNA Tech, and BCD POW Tech. Whatever rank you get will acquire you a random card within that drop pool. Although, the cards don't all have the same chances of dropping. Going back to Matt's duel, where he got an S POW on Rex, we can see that he got Ganigumo, which has a 17 in 2048, or 0.83% chance of dropping if you get an S or an A POW. So, we know the basics of dueling, and we know a bit about how the card drops work. So now, let's get into why this game is an absolute RNG fest speedrun. To begin, your starting deck is random. The 40 cards you get handed to you at the start of the game, well, it's pretty much out of your control. Although, there are a few cards that the game has to give you. For example, the game has to give you a removal card. There's a 50% chance that you'll get Raigeki, and 50% you'll get Dark Hole. Raigeki clears all monsters on the opponent's side of the field, whereas Dark Hole clears everything. So Raigeki is slightly preferred, although running with Dark Hole is fine if the rest of the deck is solid. You're also given a field card, where hopefully you'll start with either Mountain or Umi. These cards power up the main monster you'll be looking to fuse later on in this game. If you don't get this one, it's not too big of a deal. The real thing that runners will mostly reset the run over is the Equip card. Equip cards are exceptionally difficult to obtain, so starting with a good one is a necessity. Out of the 28 equip cards that you can start with, only 5 are viable to continue the run, a 17.86% chance. These are Dark Energy, Beast Fangs, Horn of Light, Dragon Treasure, and Invigoration. If you don't get one, you're better off quitting out to the main menu, resetting the run, and trying for another deck. Then of course we have the monsters, which are a bit of an added bonus. Most runners don't reset if the monster cards are bad, but there are some types that are preferred early on, such as beasts or plants. If your starting deck contains any dragons or thunders, that's a huge bonus, because Forbidden Memory's late game win condition is the almighty twin-headed thunder dragon, a strong, easily fusible monster at 2800 attack. The reason you need such specific equips and field cards from the starter deck is because those are the cards that work with twin-headed, all of them giving the monster 500 attack and defense each. Once you have your deck, the run begins by losing a scripted duel to Hai Shin, where afterwards you move on to face a bunch of opponents in the World Tournament. Rex Raptor is the first opponent in the tournament, and conveniently, he's easy to beat, and drops a bunch of really good stuff. After beating Rex, you can back out to the title screen and enter free duel mode, where you can farm him for drops, which most runners usually do. Again, beating your opponent drops a measly one card, which is one of the reasons this game can take so long to complete. On some runs, you can sit there and farm Rex for 45 minutes without a single useful drop, whereas on a different run, you could potentially skip the Rex farm if your starting deck is insane enough. <coughs> you f***ing what? Rex can drop a handful of useful dragons and thunders on SA pal such as Crawling Dragon number 2, Dragon Zombie, Ostilla Hero number 2, and Electric Snake to name a few. But he can also drop Beast Fangs on BCD ranks, useful on Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. Once you're ready to move on from farming, you'll continue through the World Tournament, and the opponents go from pretty easy to decently challenging throughout. Since you don't really have that many Thunders and Dragons at this point in the game to fuse Twin-Headed, your strategy for getting through the World Tournament will usually rely on fusing Beasts and Females that hover around the 2000 attack mark. It's surprisingly addicting to learn all the different fusions and figure out what the best play each turn is. Although, sometimes a weird one-off fusion can occur that you weren't expecting. What? What? That makes a cocoon of evolution? What the f***? Yeah. I forgot about that shit, dude. Yo, I just- I fused a f***ing tiger axe and a dark fire dragon. And it made Cocoon of Evolution. The first opponent after farming Rex is Weevil. He's easy enough. Then there's Mai, who's not too bad. Bandit Keith has a small chance to play Zoa at 2600 attack, which can be a bit troll. But otherwise, he's pretty beatable. Next is Shadi, who old school runners actually use to farm since he drops a few good thunders and dragons, but also Beast Fangs and Umi on BCD ranks. After that is Bakura, who can play Labyrinth Wall or Millennium Shield, both with 3000 defense, which can be annoying to get around. After that, it's Maximilian Pegasus, who at absolute worst can play Meteor Black Dragon, a 3500 attack monster which you have almost no chance of beating at this point in the run unless you draw Raigeki or Dark Hole. Bikuri Box is one of his more common plays at 2300 attack, tricky to get around too if you don't draw correctly. 
Pegasus can actually drop Megamorph, which is the best equip card in the entire game, giving 1000 attack and defense to any monster as opposed to the usual 500 that the other equips give. The issue with getting this card is that you need an S or an A tech as you're ranking from the fight, which is very complicated to achieve and takes a very long time. Megamorph! No way. <laughs> Holy shit! No way. Even if you do it right, Megamorph has a 64 in 2048 chance of dropping, or 3.13%. It isn't always a waste though, as other really good things can drop from S or A tagging Pegasus such as Bright Castle, an equip that works on Twin-Headed, Widespread Ruin, the best trap card in the entire game that kills an opponent when they attack, and Hamburger Recipe. You know, in case you wanted to summon Hungry Burger onto the field. Oh, please don't be gate D, please. I can't <laughs> off. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> All right. Next is Ishtar, who has one of the absolute best drop pools in the entire game. I'm talking dragons with high drop rates, Dragon Treasure, Umi, Spike Seedra, who can be combined with a single Thunder to make Twin Headed, and Widespread Ruin. She can be pretty annoying to duel though, with a rough 7.5 chance of starting the duel with a Black Skull Dragon at 3200 attack. Pretty much every run at this point will quit out to the free duel mode and farm Ishtar for hours once they've defeated her to improve their deck. She does have the downside of not dropping any Thunders, but that's where the Star Chips come in. After each duel, you'll acquire star chips depending on your rank. These can be spent in the password menu on the title screen. Runners usually spend their star chips on thunders, as dragons are generally easier to obtain through winning duels. After the Ishtar farm, you'll finish the world tournament by facing off against Kaiba, who can also play Labyrinth Wall and Millennium Shield, but also Blue Eyes White Dragon. Not terrible to deal with, especially if you just farmed Ishtar for like two hours. At this point, you may have caught on to the fact that our opponents are starting to get pretty unfair, generally summoning monsters that outright beat Twin Headed in a head-to-head. -head. Cards like Blue Eyes White Dragon, Black Skull Dragon, and Meteor Black Dragon have way more attack power than Twin Headed, and usually require an equip to beat, and in the case of MBD, two equips. If you think these cards are unfair, we're about to enter the part of the game where things get silly. There's two paths runners can take from here on out to finish the game. You can choose the Final 7 route, or the Final 6 route. The Final 7 route has you fight all of the low and high mages from each shrine, ocean, desert, mountain, forest, and meadow, to then move on to face the Final 7. In the Final 6 route, you take a detour to fight Labyrinth Mage and Seto Second before finishing the mages. This knocks the amount of fights you have to do at the end of the game from 7 down to 6. Some people prefer this way because all of the fights at the end of the game are done in a row. If you lose just one fight, even the very last one, you have to redo them all. It's absurdly punishing, and we'll talk more about it later in the video. It should be mentioned that the Final Six route isn't necessarily easier by any means. Labyrinth Mage is the first opponent in the game who has everybody's favorite monster in his deck. Gate Guardian, a 3750 attack monster that absolutely annihilates you unless you draw Regeki, Dark Hole, Widespread, or two equips with a Twin Headed. If you're used to the rules of the official trading card game, it's just so insane to see this guy just put a card with this high attack straight up raw onto the battlefield. Seto Second is super unforgiving too. He can play Gate Guardian, MBD, Metal Zoa, Black Luster Soldier, Blue Eyes White Dragon, and a fuck ton of other things too. If you beat him both, then cool, you don't have to fight Labyrinth Mage later during the final gauntlet. To unlock the mages, you must visit the Pharaoh's Palace to duel Mage Soldier. A laughably easy opponent at this point in the game, but drop-wise, he does have a 50 in 2048, or 2.44% chance of dropping Dark Energy, an equip that works for Twin Headed. After beating him, the mages are now unlocked, and you can tackle them in any order you want. The low and high mages of each shrine do need to be completed in a row, but the low mages are a tad easier compared to the high ones. The Ocean and Desert Shrines are the two easiest out of the five, with the only problem being a few strong monsters that High Ocean Mage can play, due to them getting a field buff from Umi being the default during these duels. High Mountain Mage has a low chance of playing MBD or Black Skull Dragon on turn one, absolutely devastating cards with the mountain field buff you begin on, turning them into 4k and 3700 attack monsters. 
High Forest Mage can be an absolutely ridiculous duel at times. His best card is Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth, a monster with 4k attack with the help of Forest, which the duel starts with from the beginning. Take a look at this clip from my first run of the game that I did on my Twitch stream the other week. What is this, the f***ing moth from Silent Hill? Oh my god. Come on. Play a f***ing magic. Play a magic. You f***ing idiot. No! Attack with the moth. Yes! Come on! F*** you! What is it? Not another moth. No! No! <laughs> Would you believe me if I told you that he actually played a third moth that duel? Yeah, seriously, the duels just get ludicrously difficult at this point in the game. And we're not even at the end yet. Lastly for the mages is the Meadow Shrine, and High Meadow Mage can play good old Gate Guardian. We're used to it at this point. I guess. But not with Sogan on the field. Seriously, 4250 attack points. How in God's name are you supposed to get past this shit? The only thing you can really hope for is Rageki, Widespread, or perhaps a lucky Easy Mode, as it's called. Easy Mode is a catch-all term in Forbidden Memories, where the opponent will begin by playing a relatively weak monster on their first turn, which gives you a good chance of winning the duel, since they'll continue to play monsters with equal or lower attack if you clear their monster on turn 1. With enough luck, you'll make it past the mages, and now you can either choose to go straight to the final gauntlet, or farm some more to improve your deck. You can go back to Ishtar for more dragons, widespread, dragon treasure, or an Umi. If you have a trap card in your possession, you can do Atex on Pegasus for Megamorph or other good stuff. Or you could farm low Meadow Mage for the rare 0.98% chance at an MBD drop. Mm, yeah, well, it can be beat. What? What? MBD! <laughs> what? 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 My throat device doesn't do the. <laughs> ah, there we go, baby. Let's go. Yeehaw! Doesn't mean anything. Me <laughs> MBD and Megamorph severely increase your chances at beating the final gauntlet, but you have to get lucky to get the cards, and it is by no means a guaranteed win for the end game. The final gauntlet in Forbidden Memories is without a doubt one of the hardest boss sequences in gaming. The difficulty here is legendary status. If you played this as a kid back in the day, there's almost no way you'd be able to beat it unless you knew about Twin Headed Thunder Dragon and what equips to use. When speedrunning the game, you go into these bosses with the bare minimum cards, hoping that you draw correctly, and hoping that the opponents give you easy mode. So how bad can it get? Let's go over the duelists. In the case of Final 7, Duel 1 is Labyrinth Mage. Strongest card? Gate Guardian. 3750 attack. Duel 2, Sebek. Strongest card? Zoa. 3100 attack with Yami Field Buff. Duel 3, Neku. Strongest card? Skull Knight. 3150 attack with Yami Field Buff. Duel 4, Hai Shin. Strongest card, Gate Guardian. 3750 attack. Duel 5, Seto 3rd. Strongest card, Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. 4500 attack. Duel 6, Dark Knight. Strongest card, MBD. 3500 attack. And Duel 7, Nightmare. Strongest card, Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. 4,500 attack again. It goes without saying that this part of the game is unnecessarily difficult. The worst fight of them all has to be Seto Third, who has a 55% chance of beginning the duel with a Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. If you somehow manage to take it down with widespread or removals, he'll just play another one. Yeah, he has three of them, instant death. There's basically nothing you can do to get past it, with 90% of the decks you'll have during a speedrun. Hai Shin is also super annoying, because his chance of playing Gate Guardian turn 1 is stupidly common. And because his monster is so strong, you only have so many turns to dig for equips, a removal, or MBD if you have one. If you give him control of the board, he often plays Megamorph onto a strong monster, to the point where they exceed 4000 attack, and it becomes near unwinnable from there. Alright, alright, alright. Don't, don't play another one. Oh, f*** off! 
He had another Gate Guardian and Megamorph! Uh, this is insane! What is he top decking right now? Nightmare is pretty scary too, because like with Seto, he can also play Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. The chances aren't as high as on Seto, but it's beyond infuriating spending 20 minutes to get to the fight, only to get slapped in the face with an ultimate turn 1. Besides ultimate, Nightmare also has Gate Guardian, MBD, and Moth in his deck. It's a brutal last fight. Haishin Seto and Dark Knight also have access to incredibly devastating magic and trap cards, such as Widespread Ruin, Reverse Trap, Raigeki, Shadow Spell, and Megamorph. Oh, also, the AI literally cheats from Haishin onwards. If you play a card face down, the AI is programmed to know which card it is. They can literally see through it. Not only that, on Haishin onwards, you might see a 5 card hand visually, but these goons have 20 cards in their hand! I'm dead serious! All of this is happening while you're listening to some of the most stressful music imaginable. Forbidden Memories does not fuck around. <gasps> no way! No! I just got Exodian! To get past the final gauntlet, you just need one lucky run. One attempt where everything lines up. And because that almost never happens, having splits that look like this is common. Just finishing the game is an accomplishment. The RNG is that bad. But that doesn't mean it's impossible, and some players have tried to defy the odds. How far can you push this game if you just have a little bit of luck on your side? Let's take a look at the players who have tried and succeeded. The first big world record that I remember when I first started watching For Pit of Memories was Monopoly Man's 53824, set back in March of 2013. A really nice run with 11 dragons, 7 thunders, 1 widespread, and 3 equips. Monopoly Man got two of his equips from farming Mage Soldier. Not a bad strat for the time, but one that isn't really common anymore, since drop rates are better understood now. His run also featured a first try Final 7, which is extremely uncommon to get even to this day. Many players would attempt to beat Monopoly Man's run in the coming months, and at this time, it was a thrilling time to be a spectator of Forbidden Memories. Since the game mostly centered itself around luck, practically anyone could be the next record holder. Given you understand the basics of the game, you just have to get lucky enough and who knows where good RNG might take you. It was like the Wild West, where anyone who was doing races on speedruns live could snag the record at any moment. Saboom would get very close with a 549.45, but the record wouldn't fall until June 2013, where two Brazilian players would lower it by a ton. The Urnator with 453.18, and Arcopat with 418.58. Yeah, not often you see world records being beaten by over half an hour. The record would continue to fall with GFC getting up 406.16, Colin 7 with 4 flat 56, and the Urnator again with 329.27, set in May of 2014. This record sort of marked the end of an era where, if you wanted the record now, you had to Hail Mary the final gauntlet once you started running out of time for farming. And then, hope you miraculously beat the game. The lower the record falls, the less time future runs have to farm for useful cards you'll need against people like Haishin and Seto. The world record would never see a big drastic improvement until the player Kanik would get the world's first sub 3 hour completion at 2.5308. This time is still listed as the world record today on speedrun.com. But Forbidden Memories has a big scene over in Japan as well, with their own leaderboards showcasing times that are faster than most have done in the West, with the current record being a 2.4532 by the player... Onion? Um, okay. Onion's starting deck was pretty textbook when it comes to the kind of deck you're looking for, with one dragon, one thunder, Raigeki, and Horn of Light. His Rex and Ishtar farms were extremely lucky. Out of the first three duels on Rex, one drop was Crawling Dragon number two, and the other, Dragon Zombie. On Ishtar, Onion gets a dragon treasure on his second duel, a 1.56% chance. If that wasn't enough, he then gets another one just 15 minutes later. Having three equips by the 1 hour 20 mark is not only very rare, but also ridiculously fast. He then farms until he has 55 starships to buy an Umi, then heads towards the end game. On the mages, Onion's luck continues to pile on, as he gets through them all without losing a single duel, including easy modes on High Mountain Mage, High Forest Mage, and High Meadow Mage. On Final 7, Onion makes it through the first three fights swiftly, but finds himself against two Gate Guardians on High Shin. He has Umi out, and is in desperate need of drawing an equip with the components for Twin-Headed. 
Lady Luck is on his side, and he draws exactly that, then proceeds to win the duel. Against Seto, Onion draws Umi and an equip on his first turn. If he draws a dragon, he's able to beat any card Seto has except for ultimate. When you're in a situation like this, you just gotta pray that he doesn't play it. The blessing was granted, and Seto played Gate Guardian. Onion was able to draw his dragon two turns later, and was now past the most difficult fight in the game. The string of good RNG would continue, as Dark Knight played a trap on turn one instead of a monster. Dark Knight has four traps, where two of them are practically useless and impossible to trigger. Which, guess what, is exactly what he played here. Now, it's the very last fight. This is where you realize that this is all or nothing. The stars either align right here, or you get sent back 20 minutes to the beginning of Final 7, and miss your shot at the world record. What was Nightmare gonna play this time? Ultimate. That- that's it, I guess. I can't beat that. At least, I don't think so. The lottery ticket. Rai Geki. The only card that can get you out of this position. The perfect draw at the perfect time. With two ultimate dragons staring him dead in the face, Onion strikes them with thunder and prays he goes easy from here on out. Nightmare's gimmick is that he only plays monsters. He does not have any spells or trap cards which could buy you time to stall. Onion has to hope for an incredible downgrade in attack power. He only has 3500 life points left, so it's a game of hoping that Nightmare does not play a third ultimate, Gate Guardian, MBD, or Moth. He has to hope that in that 20 card hand, not a single one is any of those four monsters. The chances are astronomically low. But on this fateful day, it really happened. And the rest is history. Black Skull, baby. It's in the bag. And that, my friends, is how lucky you need to get to get a world record in this game. And to end it all, you get the sweetest victory sound imaginable. and also the credits. Sometimes, when you least expect it, you'll make it through the final gauntlet. Sometimes, it's with a deck you never even thought could do it. It's really difficult to convey just how luck-based this game is and how difficult it is to achieve the record, let alone just finishing the game. I've been playing this game a bit on my Twitch stream lately, twitch.tv slash therixer, and people always ask me what the run length of the game is, and I can never give a straight answer. My first run miraculously beat the game in under 8 hours, an incredibly good time for a first completion, but my third run of the game legitimately took me 19 hours even with the best deck I've ever had. Featuring 14 dragons, 9 thunders, 3 equips, a widespread, an Umi, and an MBD as the cherry on top. Final 6 actually took me over 10 hours to beat, and that's not even that uncommon to see. If we return to the Speedruns Live race results page, it's just hilarious to see the amount of forfeits present here. Sometimes, you just have to surrender. The game can absolutely break your soul, giving you easy modes all the way through the final gauntlet, to then take it away from you right at the end. The game is so unpredictable in its runtime that an any percent run has never been showcased at an ESA or Games Done Quick despite the game's popularity. Although, after ESA 2016 had concluded, there was an alleged bonus stream with a Forbidden Memories run performed by Mergy with no surviving video. The run apparently went on for 12 hours without finishing. <laughs> Classic. The Forbidden Memories craze even spread to some bigger names in the scene at the time. The game is just a certified clip generator. The most absurd stuff just seems to happen all the time. And sometimes, you'll get a meme drop every now and then. Oh shit, I got a peacock. That must be because my cock needs to pee right now, so I'm doing walk away strats on Neku again. I love alcohol. <laughs> I don't know, I have zero- TRENT! Fing Trent! Let's do- Go! Oh Let's go, dude! <laughs> save! Save, save, save! save. <laughs>
Forbidden Memories still has a sizable cult following today. A lot of people speedrun card mods of the game, where you get more cards than just one from beating an opponent. It does make the drops a bit less significant, but it's far more forgiving when it comes to the time you spend on the run as a whole. Forbidden Memories also has a ton of fan-made ROM hacks that seek the goal of continuing to expand the Forbidden Memories world, and keep the fusion system that made the game so memorable. The people just wanted more FM, so the fans got to work. Even today in 2022 though, vanilla Yu-Gi-Oh! FM speedrunning still has a loyal fanbase. People still race the game from time to time, and world record attempts are being streamed on Twitch fairly regularly. Runners Tagger Player and Matt13 have both had runs well on pace to beat Onion's record, but something always goes wrong during the final gauntlet. But my money's on these two players to improve the record. Or perhaps any of the top Japanese players. It's difficult to know how active their scene really is with the language barrier and most of them streaming on Nico Video instead of Twitch. It would be silly of me to have a channel dedicated to PlayStation speedrunning lore and not talk about Forbidden Memories. It's a game that's gone down in history as one of the biggest RNG fests in all of speedrunning. Some people cannot fathom why you would ever run a game like this where nothing is in your control. On the other hand though, you can just sit back and relax, knowing that wherever the game takes you, you're just kind of along for the ride. I'm sitting here in a tuxedo, eating a salad out of the bag, bro. <laughs> Forbidden Memories is random enough where every playthrough of the game is different, and some players love that about the game. I've run games like Ratchet and Clank and Mirror's Edge, both games with extraordinarily high skill ceilings with its depthful movement. And to be honest, it's kind of nice to not have to worry about how well you play all the time. That isn't to say that Yu-Gi-Oh! FM is just play twin-headed and win lol. In the early game, you do need to know a ton of different fusions that you'll mostly learn through trial and error. There is a ton of knowledge you need to know when it comes to attaining certain ranks on specific duelists. There's things like Guardian Stars, Drop Percentages, Memorizing Password Codes, Remembering what cards the opponent can play, and so on. RNG is often despised in speedrunning, but without it, games are more likely to reach their final destination. Our journey through speedrunning is lowering the games that we love in a collaborative effort, but we never stop to think about what happens when we reach the end. When a time simply becomes maxed. Forbidden Memories, having as much RNG as it does, effectively ensures that the game's record history is never ending. You can always get a better starting deck. You can always get better drops. And you can always get luckier on the final gauntlet. To end this piece, May the RNG gods smile upon future speedruns of this frustrating, absurd, yet amazing roulette wheel of a game. Thanks for watching. If you like the content, please consider subscribing and supporting me on Patreon. Take care, and have a good one.